Welcome to the kindreds, to the kindreds all, with blessings, with honor, with worship. Now that the kindreds are here, you can sit for a little bit in contemplation of their presence and of their various attributes, or you can just continue on with the ritual. The first thing you're going to be doing after welcoming the kindreds is receiving the beginnings of the gifts that the kindreds are going to be bestowing on you, and that is wisdom through divination. Now I use runes. Um, it's just what I'm used to, and it has the added advantage of being able to fit very nicely right here in the ritual zone, and that's what you're going to need. It's going to have to be here in the ritual zone in between the offerings and the kindred stones. If you use tarot, for instance, you would need one of the smaller decks so it would be able to fit right there. You certainly don't have the space to do a full spread. So now you take this empty pitcher that you've used for the offerings and you move it over here where it's in a vertical line with the other items, the milk pitcher and the bowl for purification, forming a vertical line which is in contradiction, contradistinction to the horizontal line you'd had over here. Again, the vertical being the sacred and the horizontal being the mundane. You bring it over here and you place it down and while you're there you go and pick up your divination. This provides a nice little smooth transition. You touch your divination tools to the lamp as if connecting it with the divine presence through the fire, as if infusing your tools with the divine presence. And you say, Wisest ones whose knowledge of the Khatas is true, send me your teaching. The word Khatas is a Proto-Indo-European word. It means the pattern behind all things. If you're familiar with Germanic religion, you've heard of the Orlog or the Weird. Uh, if you're familiar with Vedic religion, you've heard of the Urta or the Rita. If you use one of those traditions, you can replace it with that. If you want to use an English word, um, you can just use the pattern beyond all, behind all things. I like Khatos because it, it well, has a lot of meaning for me as a Proto-Indo-European person, and it condenses it all into one word. So now you, you do your divining. In this case, I'm going to pick a single rune and put it down. Then return the runes to their space and sit here and interpret the rune. When I've done that, I take it and I move it over here. And I say, I hear what the kindreds have said and am made wise by it. So now I've taken the runes from the ritual zone and put them into the mundane zone as if I'm now manifesting the wisdom in my daily, daily life. Now you're going to be receiving the most important of the gifts of this ritual, the waters of life. Now I believe I've said before the waters of life equate to the general Indo-European sacred drinks, the ale of sovereignty in Ireland, the meat of inspiration in the, to the Norse, the nectar and ambrosia of the Greeks and the Romans, the Homa of Iran and the Soma of India. It's meant to infuse you with divine power. Uh, you'll see in a little bit what exactly that kind of power I'm talking about will be. Now you pick it up and you hold it in your hands like this. If you have a glass bowl, you can hold it like this so the fire actually shines through it. And you say, through the offerings I have made, I have established the bonds of hospitality with the kindreds, and in return they have given me this blazing water to drink, this sacred water, this holy water, these waters of life. Now you put it down here in the ritual zone, but not touching the, the um, offering bowls, because it isn't into the fire, it's come through the fire, as if the divine power has been infused as it does so. Remember earlier you poured these offerings into the fire, so now they're actually flowing back out of the fire. And that's part of the reason of calling it the blazing water. And in the European thought, there's a mystery, the fire-water mystery, and that's probably the central mystery of Indo-European thought, that somehow fire and water are combined, and therefore you can be drunk and can enliven you. It's sort of like the lightning coming out of the clouds or the hot springs bubbling out of the earth, both of which were considered sacred.
Now you move this bowl over here. This is going to be the libations bowl through which you return some of the water to the kindreds. You pick up the ladle over there and you purify it, putting, in the, pour it, putting water in it and pouring it out three times. You're purifying it because it's about to touch the most sacred thing in the entire ritual, perhaps next to the fire. And you ladle out three ladles worth of the waters into the bowl. And you say, may the kindreds always receive their due. You've labeled one ladle for each of the kindreds. You put the ladle here down in this dish because by touching the sacred, it has become sacred itself but it still has performed a fairly mundane function, so it goes in the mundane portion of the sacred. You pick up here, and you put it over here, touching the fire, because it's been returned to the deities through pouring in there. Now, it might seem like you're being a little selfish here. You've offered to the deities, and then you've sort of taken it back, only returning a piece of it. But that actually was the part of the ancient sacrifices. You offer the entire animal to the deities, you kill it, you give some of it to the deities, and you cook and eat the rest. It's a result of the bonds of hospitality that you're sharing something. The gods have given to you, you've given to the gods, the gods have given back to you, you now give back to the gods, and it keeps the hospitality going. There's also the sense, as in the Hindu puja, that the gods have taken the the spiritual part of it, and now, in so doing, they have blessed the material part, which you then, by consuming, receive the blessings from. So you've given the kindreds their due, and now you receive yours. Again, if you've got a glass bowl, you can hold it up so that the fire shines right through it, so it becomes blazing water in appearance. And may I receive inspiration, may I receive power, may I receive unending life. And you drink it. So those are the three main gifts considered to be given by the waters. Harkening back again to the three functions, inspiration being a first function gift, power being a second function gift, and unending life being a third function gift. By ending life, I don't mean personal immortality. I mean life that is completely full, life that is lived exactly in the moment. You leave about a third of it behind because you're going to be needing it later in the ritual. Now you just sit for a moment or two in meditation, meditating on the mystery meditating on the power that's within you, the blazing water working inside you, the presence of the kindred spreading through every part of your body. The point of the ritual is not so much meditation, so you're not going to sit here for a long time. If you wanted to meditate as part of it, that's fine. If you wanted to do a prayer or even some kind of magic, this would be the point in which to do it, because now you're infused with the sacred power. So. So, I rest myself in the presence of the kindreds. I usually meditate for five to ten breaths, just to make things aware. With the kindreds about me, and the power of their mystery within, I pray for the world and all in it. May the blessings granted to me extend to them as well. May they be happy and whole, may they be loved and lively, and may they dwell in peace, wrapped in the arms of the kindreds. Gods and goddesses, ancestors, nature spirits, I pray to you on their behalf. Okay, you've taken the, the waters that you consumed ritually and put them into the mundane sphere, thereby carrying them into the everyday life for the benefit of everybody else. So this ritual isn't just for your own benefit, it's for the benefit of everybody and perhaps everything in the world. now time to wind the ritual down. Uh, you start by saying thanks to the kindreds you've called to you. 
So you, you end in a position roughly like this, and you raise your arms to the Orans position, the praying position, and you say, Blessed ones, may you always be with me. I thank all the kindreds for your many gifts. Because you aren't really sending the kindreds away. You don't want to just get rid of them. You want them to stay in your presence in some sense, even though they're not necessarily as obviously there as they would be during the ritual. You thank them in reverse order from which you, you called them, and then put their stone over here, again in the vertical position. And you're going to be starting with the gods and goddesses, and it's sort of as if you're going back to the world that you're in. Now that's why you call the ancestors second instead of first, and that's because if you were to call them first, you'd be saying thank you to them last, and it'd be as if you were coming down into the land of the dead, and that doesn't seem like a very good idea. Going right to left. Gods and goddesses, I thank you for joining me here today. May there ever be peace between us in this world we live in. Ancestors, I thank you for joining me here today. May there ever be peace between us in this world we live in. Nature spirits, I thank you for joining me here today. May there ever be peace within us in this world we live in. Thanks to the kindreds, to the kindreds all, with blessings, with honor, with worship. And note that that exactly parallels the, the welcome at the beginning. So you've, you've bookended that part of the ritual. If you call the patron deity earlier in the ritual, this is the point at which you would give your thanks and say your goodbyes to them. Of course, especially since they're your patron, they're going to be hanging around. But formally, you're, you're saying goodbye. Perhaps you're saying goodbye of your total awareness of them. After that, you're going to be closing the gate. Just as you call, in the beginning of the ritual, you did gatekeeper deity, open the gate, patron deity, now you're doing patron deity, gatekeeper, gate, gatekeeper. So you're reversing it. To a large extent, you, that's what you do. You go in, then you go back out in reverse of what you started it as. So now I'm going to be closing the gates, put my hands over the gatekeeper bowls again. Mananon, Kirnonis, you cleared the way. Kirnonis, Mananon, you opened the gate. Close now the gate, the rites may end. May the Holy Ones yet be never far away, that they might aid me in my time of need. The gate is closed. Now at one point here I opened my hands. Um, it might better be done when I say, may the Holy Ones yet be never far away, so that you're opening your hands as if the gate is open as if they can come through to you at all times. It's also because your, your hands were kind of closed here when you have them over the bowls and they have to be open so you can close them again and close the gate. Now you have to thank your gatekeeper, or in my case, gatekeepers, and I'm going to be doing that in reverse order, just as if earlier I honored Mananon by putting him on the right and Kenonis by calling him first, I'm going to be honoring Mananon by calling him first. Mananon, I thank you for helping me today and ask that you continue to help me by clearing away the mists which separate me from the truth. Kenonis, I thank you for helping me today and ask that you continue to help me by aiding me in seeing the patterns and in conveying them to others. So now the offerings you had made to them as gatekeepers, which have to be done in the liminal section, are finally conveyed into the completely sacred section and the journey is complete. Started out mundane, fire, liminal section, liminal section, fire, sacred section. The exact prayer you're going to be praying to them will depend on the deity that you're using as your gatekeeper. I did ones that are very appropriate for Mananon and for Kenonis, and for Kenonis especially for me as, as a writer, 
the idea of finding the way things put together and then putting that together for other people is very important to me. Now you can end the rite, and the first part of this portion of the ritual is to extinguish the fire. Extinguish without, but burning within, the living fire flames within me. So the divine fire continues to live inside you, giving you your life. The rite is ended with a fire out that disperses the divine forces. So your rite is now over. You pick up your le the bell in your left hand again, and you ring it four times. Four being the mundane number, as being the four directions, therefore being on our plane. So you started out the ritual by ringing it three times to bring yourself into the sacred. Now you ring it four times to bring yourself back into the mundane. You shift it to your right hand, and you place it back where it was at the beginning. So now again, it's as if you have changed places with the with the bell, and you're back in the mundane and there in the sacred. Now the rite is now ended. So now you pick up this remainder of the waters. Because you're back in the mundane, you actually are the representative here of all the people that you prayed for. So now in order for it, the waters to become activated in this world, you yourself drink it. Now you sit in a very short meditation, in fact, for four breaths, just as you meditated for three breaths in the beginning for the sacred, and rang the bell three times for the sacred, and now you've rung the bell four times for the mundane. Now you take four breaths for the mundane. Just sit there with your eyes closed and take your four breaths. That'd be kind of boring to watch. And then you're done with the ritual. After the ritual, when you're putting things away, you put the offerings the waters here and the milk offering here and you put them in your house shrine. If you have a shrine specifically for the hearth goddess, of course this would go in front of it and this would go in front of a shrine for the kindreds. If you don't have specifically a shrine, put them next to your stove as close as you can get to it. You leave them there about 24 hours to maintain them as being an offering and then take them outside and pour them somewhere. I Pour them just in my, I can pour them in my garden. I also have a rock out back that I use for offerings to the nature spirits. And I say, to the spirits, the leavings. So that's the remainders of, of a sacrifice. They get their part as well. And once you do that, the whole ritual is completely done. This is the end of the video. Thank you. And again, if you haven't watched the first few parts of it, please go back. Links are in the description.